A young man is having a hard time. School isn't going well and neither is his social life. Logan Schindelman had been a star football player in high school and was popular and well-liked, so this was a different experience for him. Although the idea of being adrift isn't exactly unusual for someone the year after they graduate high school. But on May 19th, 2016, Logan told his grandmother he had an epiphany about his life. She knew Logan was trying to figure himself out and hoped that this would lead to a breakthrough and him getting his life back on track. But instead, Logan left her home and never returned. After some bizarre sightings the next day, it seemed as though this case would resolve itself quickly. But instead, Logan's family and the small town of Tumwater, Washington, are still waiting for answers five years later. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Logan Schindelman. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is... And then they were gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us here once again. Um, This is actually a case I've been wanting to cover for a while because I honestly can't believe it hasn't been solved. I first heard of Logan Schindelman from an episode of Disappeared, and my heart broke for this guy. He's just one of those people who really seemed to have everything going for him until it all started to go wrong. For those of you who follow us on social media, you'll uh, see that I actually wrote, I worked on this on the train. We were in New York this past weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, I tagged along with Ethan on a work trip, which was very fun. Yeah. I I mean, it was, you you got to enjoy the city a a bit more than I did. (laughs) Yeah. It was great having you there though. Thank you. But yeah, so I was, I edited our last episode on the train. I wrote this one on the way back. So we are all ready to go because even when I'm out of town escaping all of my children, I'm still doing this. (laughs) (laughs) All right, but let's get into it. Logan Drew Schindelman was born on June 27th, 1996 in Olympia, Washington to Hannah Schindelman. Hannah was a bit of a free spirit, and the story of how Logan came into the world really sounds kind of like the beginning of some sort of romantic comedy. Hannah was in her early 20s when she met Logan's father, a Saudi Arabian man who was in Washington State working as an engineer. And so because he was only here for like this particular project or whatever with his job, he was on a limited visa. So he eventually had to go back to Saudi Arabia. During the short time he was stateside, he and Hannah had an affair and Hannah became pregnant. Now, you say they had an affair. Uh, no, I just mean like a like they, a they happy just, love affair. Okay, like he okay. wasn't married or anything like that, to my knowledge. I mean, gotcha. I don't know. Okay. But no, it was just like, you know, very like it romantic. Nefarious. It was just. No, it was yeah. just we had an affair. Like it was a very like romance novel. Gotcha. Kind of affair. But she became pregnant. So in the romantic comedy version of this story, they would meet up years later and after a series of mishaps and like probably somebody being left at the altar, they would fall in love and live happily ever after with their blended family, probably in some other third country. But obviously life is in a romantic comedy. And so in reality, it doesn't sound like the pair really even kept in touch. And I haven't been able to find anything that definitively states whether or not he even knew that he had fathered a child. Oh, my. Yeah. So I don't even know if she knew she was pregnant before he left or if like they didn't keep in touch and she found out after and couldn't get in contact with him or didn't want to get in contact with him. Yeah, but, or, or maybe she did and there's some cultural issues that maybe he doesn't want to 
Yeah, I I have no idea. Who knows? No idea. But in any case, I don't even know the guy's name. He has never been in the picture whatsoever. So Logan not only grew up without a father, but I think just as importantly, he grew up without any ties to his Saudi Arabian heritage. Okay. Because, you know, obviously, like, he didn't know his father, so he clearly didn't know anybody on that side of the family either. His mother met his father in Washington, so, you know, she had also never been to Saudi Arabia, knew nothing of the culture, and was just in as in the dark as Logan was growing up. I only bring this up because Logan's racial identity and the disconnection he felt from his heritage was a big part of his life in the few years leading up to his disappearance. And it wasn't only his Middle Eastern heritage that he was disconnected from. Logan's mother, Hannah, was mixed race. So her mother, Ginny, is white, but her father is black. So Logan was one quarter white, one quarter black, and half Saudi Arabian, but he presented as black. So, you know, that's just with for people who didn't know his background, they would just assume he was black. Gotcha. But by the time Logan came around, Hannah's father and his family, so like the African-American part of his family, weren't really a part of her life. So Logan also grew up without the black side of his family. Oh, wow. So that that's um, probably presenting a lot of uh, cultural challenges for him. Well, yeah, exactly. And so like he grew up only with the white part of his family. Yeah. Logan had an older half-sister named Chloe and who I believe her father was white. So I think Chloe's just white. So, like, again, (laughs) you know, his mom is white, his grandma's white, his sister's white, and, you know, all of the people of color in his family he doesn't have a relationship with. Right. And remember when I said that Hannah was, like, kind of a free spirit? Mm Mm-hmm. So when Logan and Chloe were both little, she asked her mother, Ginny, if she would take custody of the children so she could attend art school in Seattle. Like when the kids were born and they were little, she already lived with Ginny. So they all already lived at Logan's grandma's house. Okay. Um, And so the way Ginny describes it on Disappeared is that she needed to take custody of the kids basically in order to get them on her health insurance. This is Ginny. Yeah, the grandma. Okay. Yeah, so that's basically why... So it wasn't like Hannah was giving up custody of her kids because she didn't want to take care of them. It was more of just like a logistical... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, I've experienced some of that. uh, Not personally. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Um, But when I was a a caseworker, when I was a social worker. Right, right, yeah. that, That was pretty common. So, yeah, I I understand where, like, how that home scenario is set up. Yeah, and so I don't want it to seem like Hannah took off and abandoned her children, because she absolutely didn't. Like, she went to school, but then she came back and moved to Olympia, which is, like, just a few miles from Tumwater. So she was always close by. She was always a part of her kids' lives. They just lived with Ginny, and she had, you know, custody of them. Right, for legal purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Logan grew up at his white grandmother's house in Tumwater, Washington, which is a white town. Oh, okay. Yeah. In 2018, like I looked it up. In 2018, it was nearly 82% white and only 1.74% black. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, like, okay. So I have to imagine that the number of people who shared Logan's background was zero. Yeah. Well, de- well definitely with, with the, the, the Saudi Arabian father. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was literally just him mm-hmm. in Tumwater, you know? Oh, and just as a side note, another stat that I found when I was looking that up was that 0% of households in Tumwater speak a non-English language at home as their primary language. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, like, my point is that, holy shit, this town is extremely white. 
I was actually listening to an episode of Armchair Expert right before I was writing this episode because that's all I did when we were in New York is I walked around the city and listened to podcasts. I caught up on so many podcasts <laughs> last week and it was great. And they interviewed, this episode was when they interviewed Prince Harry and okay. it was freaking fantastic, by the way. But anyway, they brought up an expression that they've said before, which is that you don't see the water that you're swimming in. Mm, okay. And that really made me think back to when I had originally seen this episode of Disappeared, which, as I mentioned, is how I kind of got introduced to this case. Everyone in Logan's life that they interviewed for that show was super sweet. And I believe that they had the best of intentions, but it was painfully clear to me that they had no concept of how othered Logan was. Mm. Like they just didn't notice the whiteness because it was the water they were swimming in. Right. Right. Like yeah. they just didn't see it. But Logan noticed. Logan's grandmother, Jenny, said in that episode of Disappeared, quote, I know that Tom Water has a tendency to be blue eyed, blonde haired, but I don't think he had a hard time being the only black person in our family. End quote. <laughs> sure. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure he didn't have any trouble with that at all. I know. And it's like, it's cute. And yes, I mean, I'm sure to an extent it's even true because Ginny really does seem like a lovely woman. And Logan seems like he was close with his family, you know, like it does seem that he had a good relationship with him. I, I'm not trying to paint a picture oh, of no, this no. like tortured there, child. No, but you there's, know. there's definitely some, there's going to be some identity issues there just dealing with his ethnicity. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not having anybody in his family or potentially even in his life that is an influence that is from that particular ethnicity. Yeah. And I think I did make the mistake earlier when I was describing his family of like referring to his mom as white, which she definitely is not. I mean, I've never, so Hannah wasn't interviewed for disappeared. I've actually never seen a picture of her, but Hannah's half black. So I'm assuming, you know, that she presents as black that like, and she definitely had that experience of being mixed race right. in this small town. Hannah's father's, like I said, her father and her father's family weren't really involved in her life. So she, I'm sure, had a lot of the same issues growing up that her son did. Yeah, yeah. And and, and to Ginny's point, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she said that, what was the quote? Like he he didn't feel like an outsider being the only black person in, in their family. family. Yeah, so that is so, interesting. In the sense of familial ties, like I'm sure he didn't feel awkward about it because everybody's a family member. But there, but yeah, I, I'm I'm sure it, on on some level he he felt isolated. Right, right. You know, and it, that is interesting with. Ginny's daughter with Hannah being, you know, half black that she referred to Logan as the only black person in their family. So I don't know, maybe Hannah doesn't present as black. I, like I said, I've never seen a picture of her. I have no yeah. idea. I don't know how she identifies. I don't know anything. I just know that Logan's sister, Chloe, cause there was a photo of them at like Disneyland or something. And she presents as white, I would say. But in any case, like I said, he was very close to his family. His great aunt and uncle lived nearby. And one of his jobs, because right before he disappeared, he had several jobs. And one of them was helping them out on their five acre farm nearby. So, and they apparently, like, he apparently is a really like good worker and everything. And they paid him a bunch of money. Um, and, you know, plus, like I said, his mom just lived in Olympia. So Logan was surrounded by a loving family. Like mm -hmm. he had a good family. Yeah, the, the network is solid. Right. But despite their best efforts, I can't imagine that Logan never had a problem with being the only black person. Sure. You know? Yeah. One of his friends, Dakota, who he played uh, football with in high school, is another person who's extensively interviewed in that episode. And like, bless his heart. He seems like an absolute sweetheart, like a beautiful, clueless cinnamon bun <laughs> of a sweetie. <laughs> and I was going to transcribe how he described Logan's relationship with race, but, like, I think it's just better if you listen to it for yourself. I don't think he ever f***ed different because he was African-American, like, ever. Uh, Tom Water wasn't really like that. 
I mean, it was predominantly white, but minorities, they weren't like, like pushed out or like ever treated differently ever. So he's so sweet. <laughs> His whole demeanor is, is, is very innocent, but it, it's yeah. spoken from a, a white person who has never stepped into the shoes of a minority. Right, has, and grew up in a small town, and just like, yeah, he just does, hasn't thought of it. That's the thing. Yes, he doesn't see the water that he's swimming in, and right. that's all it is. Like, I don't think he has a single bad intent. No, like, not at all. At all, right? And it, and that's just all it is. And I think we just see so so much of that. And I mean, I really identified with that, with the like his whole idea and demeanor and like everything that he said because you know growing up here in northern virginia in a very weird area Mm -hmm. which was like southern but like not southern but southern and we have a lot of like really confusing views on race here right and a lot of it was this it was just like no i don't see color like there's so much of that and you know for those of you who follow us on twitter like (laughs) you see i've commented on a few things our county right now where we currently live loudon county virginia is all over the news and has been all over the news over fox news mainly for months because like yeah all of the good white people are like letting their super racist like transphobic asses show all over the place and you know as liberal as a lot of people are here i think we just there's a lot of this underneath a lot of people who excuse racism by you know saying things like i don't see color and i only have love in my heart when they're like (laughs) like to like really you know putting people down And I I think uh, fundamentally, we've had conversations about this before, like most white people cannot understand what it's like to be a minority. Mm -hmm. So for them to pass judgment on a minority and how they act or how they react to things is absurd Mm -hmm. because you are not a minority. You have so much privilege and it's so different the way you grow up, the way that you're, that you interact with anybody. (laughs) I mean, not just law enforcement. Yeah. Kind of law enforcement, but you know, to just to, to have that, that arrogance uh, to say, I don't see color. Mm -hmm. That's like probably meant, meant with the best intentions, but oh my God, I hate that. Yeah. (laughs) Like it's, it's, it's just so terrible. You don't see color. So you're just erasing like, yes. everyone, basically. Exactly. Yes. Like, your culture doesn't matter to me. <laughs> yes, Ex- yes, exactly. Yes, that's that's. it's infuriating to me when people say, I don't see color. Like, that's, yeah. that, yes, like, you're, you're just ignoring any other culture in the world. Yeah, it's it's pretty intense. But anyway, which, not which to is get not the, which is not the intention of saying that. I know the intention is supposed to be, is supposed to be I'm not racist, but by saying I don't see color, you are therefore saying you are racist. Well, no, it's what's funny is I think you actually hit on it because um you said the intention is to say I'm not racist, but uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but there's a, really but there's a huge like, caveat all, to it. <laughs> it's really how all of these like Facebook comments that I've been seeing over the past month have gone. I mean, they don't actually say it often, but yeah, the the subtext is always I'm not racist, but let me say this incredibly racist. Right. Thing. Yeah. It, it, this is not a, a, a bless her heart experience. You know, was, you know, the like. Yeah. F- well, for Dakota, it is. <laughs> well, I, I guess. Well, yeah. I sure. mean, he was like, he was, like, bless his heart. I don't know. I, I think, <laughs> well, I, I want to think, <laughs> I want to think that Dakota is like off, like he's graduated college by now. He like learned a lot since this episode of disappeared was filmed like i think i think dakota is going to be cool but but yeah this story is really full of well-intentioned white people who just don't go below the surface because yes like logan was popular you know he was a star football player in high school he was friendly like 
People liked him. He had a lot of friends. He was one of those kids who got good grades without trying very hard, you know? Yes, but given all of those things, it does not mean that there isn't something underneath the surface. And it's so funny the way that this episode was shot, too, because like right after Dakota says this whole thing, Ginny comes back on uh, Logan's grandma and we immediately get this story from her that basically proves that like Dakota's perception of reality is not true. And, you know, basically Tumwater is a place that is real and exists in America. Right. So the story that Jenny tells is that Logan was at this party his senior year. And basically some drunk kids decided to be assholes and apparently started giving him shit for being black and Saudi Arabian. According to Ginny, they were hurling racial slurs toward him in a joking way. Okay. Yeah. Which, again, definitely I have been in many, many situations where white people love doing this. They love, like, joking around and, like, being ironically racist, which is really just being racist. But, like, in the, like, early 2000s, you could totally get away with this. And apparently it was like one main girl who was doing this at the party. But this party really seemed to be a turning point in Logan's life. He called Ginny to come pick him up. And when she did, he told her, quote, they weren't even there for me. I thought I had friends, but I don't. End quote. And like that, oh God, that like, that was such a dagger, you know, hearing that. Because that's huge. Like, it wasn't even the girl who was talking shit that he was upset about. No, it was his friends that didn't back him up. Right. That just kind of passively went along with it. Like, they didn't join in or whatever, but they didn't, you know, shut her down either. Right. And I think that Logan came to the realization that night that as much as they'll pal around with you and let you in at the end of the day, like, you're still an outsider to these people. Yeah. Yeah. So after that, Logan started withdrawing from his friends, like all of them, even Dakota, who wasn't even at that party. They would text him and he just wouldn't answer. And he even went so far as to change the college he was planning on attending in the fall. He chose Washington State University, partly because no one he knew was going there. WSU also apparently had the benefit of a more diverse student body, which, you know, was probably another reason that Logan decided to go there. But like so many students before him, Logan had a rude awakening when he got to college. Uh. It turns out that if you party all the time and you don't like do your assignments, (laughs) (laughs) then you tend not to do well academically. Uh, I I, I was in that category. Yeah. Didn't have any trouble in high school. Made it to college, definitely partied a lot the first semester and was placed on academic probation. Ooh. I still graduated with 3 0. Yeah. Yeah. But that, you know, it, it was an uphill battle from the first semester. Yeah. That's funny because sadly, I was, I did the same thing. I wasn't bad enough to get an academic probation, but my first semester freshman year was definitely my worst grade wise. And I didn't even party. Yeah. I was going to say you, <laughs> you didn't start really partying until you met me. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but I was like much older and out of college. I was extremely boring in college. Some would call it lame. Yes. Many, many would, but it got really bad for Logan and he was actually academically dismissed. Oh ouch. Yeah. Yeah. So he washed out and he went back to his grandmother's house in Tumwater. The whole going away to college thing and coming back didn't seem to change Logan's stance on wanting to get away from the high school drama, though, because it doesn't seem like he reconnected with anyone when he came home. Um, Like Dakota talks about, he's like, yeah, I would call him and text him and be like, Hey, it's been a long time. Haven't seen you. And like Logan just wouldn't respond. And other people said that they would, you know, message him on social media and they could see that they were, he was reading the messages, but yeah, just again, not responding. 
Instead, he worked odd jobs, including his family's farm, like I mentioned before, and he also worked for a laundry service. I don't know if this happened kind of before or after his, that whole party, but before he left for college, he decided that he really wanted to connect with the African-American side of his family. So before he left for college, he reached out to that side and he contacted his great aunt, Tina, who was his grandfather's sister and the two met The whole reason why this part of the family wasn't involved in Logan's life differs depending on who's telling the story. Sure. Ginny says that after she and Hannah's father split, she just like kind of lost touch with that side of the family. She never deliberately kept Logan from them, but they never really made an effort to meet him. So it just kind of, you know, fizzled fizzled out. out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But if you ask Tina, she says that Ginny deliberately cut them out of Logan's life and that they wanted to be a part of his life, but that they couldn't. And so, I mean, honestly, I, I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And, and, and it could just be different perceptions. Exactly. Of, yeah. of what actually occurred. Whatever the truth actually is, Tina was under the impression that Logan was going to keep this meeting secret from Ginny because he was afraid that she'd be upset that he was meeting with this like side of the family. So he went over to Tina's house for dinner and, you know, they looked at photo albums and according to Tina, he was really excited to see people who looked like him in those photos, which sure, right. Like you could only imagine, but she was incorrect about Logan keeping this whole thing as a secret. Like apparently he went, you know, he went home to Jenny's house and immediately told her all about it and confided in her. And according to Jenny, Logan told her that Tina complained about her a bunch. And that kind of turned Logan off because he was like, why is she complaining about this person who took care of us from the very beginning? Right. You know, so it just seems like there was a lot of like bitterness and kind of drama between the two sides of the family. So while Tina and Logan kept in touch through social media, you know, after he graduated high school and when he went to college, that was the only time he ever went over there. So this is kind of where Logan is in 2016. He got kicked out of school. He's back home in his grandmother's working odd jobs. He's still estranged from his friends and finding his grandfather's side of the family while positive wasn't exactly like a life changing experience for him. Though Logan and his grandmother were getting along fine, there was some tension in the house. But this was with his sister's boyfriend. Oh, that's interesting. Logan's sister, Chloe, also lived at Jenny's house still, and she had brought her boyfriend to move in with them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. He and Logan did not get along from the beginning. And from what little information is available about this dude, he kind of seems like an asshole. He actually had a record for felony assault, and it sounds like it was a DV charge. Oh. Yeah, not against Chloe. This is like a previous relationship. All right. So like there, but that's a risk factor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And in addition to his general sense of aimlessness, he has this potentially violent person living in his home. According to Ginny, Logan also started smoking a lot of pot around this time. Oh, uh, okay. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And it seems like this may have been something he had been doing recreationally for a while, you know, just as like a kid. But it does seem like it increased after this whole freshman year of college. And Ginny said that it made him slightly paranoid. So while I do hate that every time there's a hint of drug use, a lot of articles in these cases will automatically point to that as a reason for the person's disappearance. But like in this case, I do think it could be at least partially relevant just to go to his state of mind and what was like going on with him at the time. And I should also point out that while marijuana is the only drug that we know for sure Logan was involved with, there have been like hints of possibly others, maybe, but no proof 
nothing. It kind of comes up a little bit later, but again, like nothing has ever been proven. Nobody's ever come out and said like, yes, I did X, Y, and Z with Logan, or he bought this for me or, or anything like that. Okay. But, you know, I think it's important to talk about like risk factors, right? You know, and what's going on in their life right before they disappear. So you've got this violent, you know, person living in the home. You have a sense of aimlessness that could be leading to a depression or in a depression or or something oh, yeah, like no, that. Oh, yeah, no, I, de- I definitely agree with you there. I mean, I think that, that he was, just in how he was reacting to his lifelong friends right. up to this point, I mean, that is showing signs of, of depression. Right, right, exactly, you know? like isolating yourself. Yeah, 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 absolutely. For sure. And then, you know, I think the, like, the smoking a lot of pot and, you know, if that did actually make him paranoid, because, you know, that's one of those things that affects people differently, right? And so some people are totally fine, but for some people it, it does affect their mental health in a positive or a negative way, right? I guess it depends on the quality of what they're smoking. <laughs> sure. But it also depends, I think, on your personal brain chemistry, too. It does. It's funny you bring this up that I, I read some quote, and I'm going to butcher it. Uh, mm-hmm. It was just today. Um, that said, it was something about... Um, how marijuana is not a gateway drug. It's oh, yeah. yeah. The, the gateway no, is... I definitely don't believe that. But yeah. There is no gateway drug. Right. The gateway is is your your mental status at the time right. and your socioeconomic status and, you know, all of the factors that go into why you're using drugs to begin with. Right, right. You know, it's interesting that you brought that up. Yeah, and I'm not trying to go all, like, reefer madness or anything like that. Yeah, please I- don't, because there's also <laughs> no indication of any studies ever that marijuana like is terrible for you? No. And I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying that it could potentially have something to do with his state of mind at the time. Yes. I'll give you that. Yeah. 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 And, and so whether it's drug related or not, or if he was on other drugs, Logan was acting a bit strangely right before his disappearance. On the morning of May 19th, 2016, Ginny was getting ready for work. It was around 7.30 a.m. and Logan came in from outside. And so, like, Logan was 19. It was obviously very weird for him to even be awake at 7.30 a.m., much less, like, out of the house and doing things. Sure, yeah, yeah. And we can't even get our 12-year-olds up before 9. No, not at all. So... (laughs) But he had told Ginny that he had been out driving around. Interesting. Yeah. So like very not normal behavior for him. Maybe I'm jumping ahead here. Mm -hmm. Do we know anything about what he was doing the night before? No, actually. Okay. Proceed. I think he might have been working because I think he worked evenings at the laundry service. Okay. But I am not positive. Okay. I'm just trying to build a timeline in my head. Mm -hmm. So 7 a.m., 7.30 7.30-ish. 7.30 yeah. So he had been out driving around for some period of time. Okay. Don't know how long. But he told Ginny that he had an epiphany about his life. And she was like, okay, cool. Like, it's 7.30. <laughs> like, I'm trying to go to work. I want my coffee. Like, th- I'm sure this is super great. And we will talk about it tonight when I get home. Mm-hmm. You know? But Logan wasn't home when she got back, even though she was expecting him to be. What time did she get home? I'm not sure exactly. Just in, it just says like in the evening. Okay. And this wasn't completely weird. You know, again, he's 19, he's working multiple jobs. Like it's pretty normal for him to just be out and about, you know? Sure. Yeah. But when a few hours went by and she hadn't heard from him, she pinged his phone And so his phone pinged in Olympia, which, you know, is where Hannah lived, his mom. So he was just like, oh, okay. He just went over to Hannah's house, like whatever. And so she didn't think much of it. But a few days go by and she still hasn't heard from her grandson. So on May 22nd, she gave Hannah a call to see what was up. And again, I have, it doesn't say this explicitly in anything that I read, but like I have to imagine she's been calling and texting him during this time and he hasn't been responding because, you know, I don't imagine that she like 
never tried to call him and <laughs> yeah, then yeah. pinged his phone and then waited two days and then called his mom, you right, know? Right. So yeah, so on May 22nd, she calls Hannah, but Hannah told her that she hadn't seen Logan in over a week. Oh. So now Ginny is, of course, like incredibly worried. Yes, Logan's an adult, so it's not abnormal for him to go stay at his mom's without mentioning anything to her. But it, you know, was super weird for him to just take off completely without telling anyone. Right, but his phone is still pinging in Olympia? So I'm not exactly sure if it's still pinging in that area on May 22nd. I'm or that's going just where she pinged it. On May 19th. On May 19th, okay. So Ginny, you know, she starts to make all the calls you would expect her to make to see if anyone has seen Logan. When she strikes out there, she goes driving around town to look for him. When she still has no luck, she goes down to the Thurston County Sheriff's Office to report her grandson missing. But this was a Sunday, and the police station was closed for the weekend. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. And now I thought this was funny too, but I, I think there's a 60% chance that our police station also closes on the weekends. Uh, no, it you don't think not. so? No, I think we need to like check because I kind of think that like if we went over there on a Saturday, like the doors would be locked. A hundred percent not. Okay. All right. Well, all right. We're going to, we're going to see this weekend. We'll report back. <laughs> Follow us on social media. I'll put it on Twitter. But anyway, the Thurston County Sheriff's Office was closed for the weekend. And so Ginny had to go back the next day to actually file a report. Okay. And this is when we find out that the fact no one really knew that Logan was missing harmed the investigation, perhaps irreparably. So Ginny goes to the sheriff's office and she's giving them all of Logan's information, including the information about his vehicle, which was a 1996 Chrysler Sebring convertible. So they ran the license plate through the system and bingo, they immediately hit pay dirt. The sheriff's deputy tells Ginny that Logan's car had been impounded three days earlier on May 20th. So the day after right. she had last seen him. Okay. Where was it impounded from? It had been found abandoned in the middle of the interstate. Oh. Apparently, it was found on I-5 between Tumwater and Maytown, which is obviously not a good sign. But even worse was what was found inside. Logan's driver's license wallet, debit card, and cell phone. There were even, like, weirdly, there, like a bag of gas station snacks inside, like power bars and stuff like that. Huh. So Ginny's already concerned, obviously, and she has to be feeling pretty helpless at this point because nothing special was done with the car when it was impounded. Logan hadn't been in the system because he hadn't been reported missing by that part. By that point. So the car wasn't treated as a crime scene or anything like that. Right. No, it was just impounded and inventoried. Exactly. Yeah. But the problem with that is not only was Ginny not notified, you know, that this car had been impounded, but the car, according to them, couldn't be processed because it was already contaminated from the impound process. So a lot of valuable evidence potentially was lost. And this does make sense, but like I kind of do have a problem with this idea in general. And everything, every article that I read, even that episode of Disappeared, they just like presented this as fact. Like the car couldn't be processed because it was contaminated by the impound process. And like, sure, but... I, I get it. There's a ton of cross-contamination. You know, the people who towed it weren't wearing gloves. They weren't trying to preserve anything. But I still feel like they could have done something, right? Well, yeah, yes. You're not going to be able to get legitimate DNA 
off of anything in there because because of the amount of people that have been in and out of the car. However, fingerprints. Right. I still feel like you can still fingerprint uh, the vehicle. Yeah. And, and take fingerprints can, and then take fingerprints of the guys who right, work at the. Uh, yes. You yeah. Can, you can you can retroactively retroactively eliminate uh, suspects. Like yes, it'll be a pain in the that. ass. But yes. Yeah. It would be a huge pain in the ass. But I'm sure there is some sort of documentation as far as who was actually in the car or right. who touched the car or whatever. Yeah. And even if even, there even isn't, if, like, just take just everyone like a, who was working that day. It, well, sure. <laughs> but but there that's not. I mean. You have one crew or or one truck, one tow truck that picks up the car, even if it's not related to any police activity. Mm-hmm. Towing companies keep records of 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 every vehicle that they tow, mm-hmm. so that the owner can come back and find it. Right, right. So you know you would have that record, which also indicates the the driver of the tow truck. So you can eliminate that person, mm-hmm. take their take their fingerprints, match them with whatever fingerprints you find on the vehicle. I mean, it's a tow yard, sure, but it's not it's not like a free for all. It's not like right. I don't think people are going to be climbing in and out. Sixty employees, like, yeah. going in and out of this vehicle, exactly. You know, and but you said it was impounded. Mm-hmm. So was it impounded by the police? That's what it sounds like, yes. And so this is the so other that's, part. That's even more secure. That's what I'm saying. And this is the other part that bothers me because of what witnesses said once police started investigating. And and this is why the car was impounded. Three 911 calls were made about Logan's car that day on the 20th. 911 calls, not just... 911 calls, okay. yeah. Because witnesses said that the car had veered across all of the lanes of traffic on the interstate and then stopped after it hit the middle Jersey barrier. But bizarrely, no one appeared to be driving the car. One caller said that the car had actually been parked on the shoulder of I-5 and that a white man with brown or red hair had jumped out of the passenger side and run into the woods on the side of the highway. And then the car took off and veered through all the lanes of traffic and hit the so, Jersey supposedly barrier. Supposedly without a driver. Right. Interesting. Well, yeah, but police thought that maybe that man had accidentally knocked the car into gear. When he was getting out, right? Because sure. this is probably a stick shift. And that's why I kind of was veering all over the place. And so before I get into what the police did, you know, after this, like, I really want to go back to the fact that that police received three 911 calls and that's what led them to this car and what led them to impound it. And I get that it wasn't, it didn't seem to be involved with a crime at the time, it just seemed like an accident or an abandoned vehicle or whatever. But I just feel like there's still something that they could have done with this car instead well, of just saying, oh, it's cross-contaminated. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. Even before that, I'm wondering what efforts were made to contact anybody with ties to the car. I mean, right. I, I understand that like they're not going to go crazy and go out of their way to find out, you know, kid's grandma well exactly whatever, like i get but, why they wouldn't have contacted jenny right yeah, i mean <laughs> yeah but the, i mean vehicle was supposedly abandoned mm-hmm. and then involved with it in an accident mm-hmm. uh you know luckily nobody else was involved right but they also found his id his cell phone mm-hmm. right so maybe there's some sort of investigation that starts there like why why did this kid leave all of this stuff in his car yeah and then leave right and so it's interesting because police did search and i'm not in it seems like the search was initiated after logan was reported missing but i'm not positive like it could have potentially been initiated after the reports from the 911 callers But they searched a two-mile radius in the woods where, 
you know, this whole thing reportedly happened where the person like was parked and then jumped out and ran. And they even used canines and cadaver dogs. So I kind of do think it had to have happened after Logan was reported Probably. missing and not, yeah. you know. They're not going to release the dogs off of uh, an abandoned vehicle. Right, yeah. right. Even if there was like a weird story about a man jumping out of it. Yeah. But they even used a heat-seeking aircraft, but they didn't find any sign of like this man who the witness saw or Logan. And keep in mind, Logan was last seen on May 19th. So though his car was there on the 20th, like we have no idea if Logan was right. There's no indication that he was in the, no, we have no. Vehicle. Yeah. So at this point we don't know, like we know that all of his stuff is in the car, but we don't know if he is because to this day, nobody has come forward definitively saying that they saw Logan after May 19th. A few weeks later, another tip came in and this one was from someone who was traveling on a road parallel to I-5, and they said that they saw a black man with no pants on, like running around. On the same day as as the car? Yes. So May 20th? Yeah. Okay. And so this really started getting people worried about the drug angle because this apparently where the man was traveling and where he saw this, like on this road that's parallel to the interstate, was an area with known drug houses. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that person was was Logan. Not at all. Okay. It just means that if he did see a black man running around with no pants on, it was part of the 1.72% of black people who live in Tumwater, potentially. Sure, yeah. You know, so like, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that there aren't a lot of black people, so like the odds are better than if it was just a random white person running around. But no, it does not at all mean that it was Logan. And to this day, again, five years later, there's been no evidence that has ever been uncovered that does say that this was him. So at this point, police are looking at all of the angles and all the possibilities, including the dreaded, he just walked away from his life. (laughs) Yeah. Here we go again. Yeah. Walked away from his life and he left all of his belongings inside Mm -hmm. of his car conveniently to be found. Yeah. Apparently a new post was made from his Facebook account because, you know, obviously everybody, police, family, friends, everybody's monitoring his social media accounts very closely by this point. And so like a post came up from Olympia airport. And so like that got all excited and then, you know, rumors started flying around. Some people even speculating that Logan had taken off to Saudi Arabia to find his father. Yeah. I I thought that that's kind of where you were going to go as a a possible theory uh, at the, at the onset. It's not outside of the realm of possibilities, but I mean, you know, he had contact with, the African American side of his family mm-hmm. and presumably relatively positive mm-hmm. seems like a bit of a stretch to just up and go to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. It, with no money. With like, yeah, not even, well, I mean, we don't know whether he had a passport, but he definitely didn't have his driver's license. Oh no, we do know okay, that he did go. not have a passport. And so that's why Jenny's like, what? No, he didn't go to Saudi Arabia. Like this kid didn't have a passport. Like what All are you right, talking well, about? There you go. So he didn't have a passport. So that cuts that out right now. Right. That's and better. the Facebook whole, the f- Facebook post, like it turned out to be a memory from a year before. Like, so it wasn't even a real thing, right? Like total red herring. There's no indication that he had any idea how to get in touch with his father or anybody in his family or anything. And plus, like I said, he didn't have his passport, you know, nothing. So he's not going to Saudi Arabia. No. A more realistic possibility came in the form of his sister's shitty boyfriend. Police had found out about this guy's record, so they brought him in for questioning. But he said that things weren't actually that bad bad between him and Logan and that some family members had just kind of blown everything out of proportion. Plus Chloe and Ginny both said that despite his past, he had never displayed violent tendencies while in their home. 
he volunteered to take a polygraph and he passed. So police kind of ruled him out. Okay. Well, I mean, polygraph is on, isn't a hundred percent. Right. Of course. So not even I, close. No, that I don't necessarily think that a polygraph polygraph should rule someone out exclusively. Right. Um, but you know, having, having a history, he's got one charge of, of DV that we know of, again, he might have yeah. more. That's just the only thing that I found mentioned. Because, like, none of the articles even mentioned this guy's name. So I, I had no way of looking up anything else. Sure. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, I mean, you don't know what that DV charge entails. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean he has a violent past. No, it, I'm, listen, I'm going to say, yes, it does mean he has a violent past, but it doesn't mean he has a violent present. All right. But in any case, they ruled him out. And so over the next year, the Tumwater community really banded together and they sold stickers and raised $10,000 for a reward for information in Logan's disappearance. But despite this, I mean, leads just really dried up. Logan's family didn't give up, though. They kept on putting up flyers and posting on social media, and it worked. On June 26th, 2017, just over a year after Logan was last seen, they got what may have been their best tip yet. A witness came forward and said that she had seen Logan's car on the highway on the day he went missing. And what's more, she says she thinks she saw Logan. Okay. According to her statement, two white men and a black man were standing at the back of the car. She was driving, so like she didn't, you know, see a whole lot you know, she didn't see whether they opened the trunk or not or anything like that, but she did get a good look at one of the white men. He had scraggly blonde hair kind of cut into a bowl cut and was wearing what sounds like a crop top and very small jean shorts. <laughs> I don't know. It The whole description sounds weird. And the sketch is downright terrifying. <laughs> I'm sure. It's like, I'll show it to you. It's like insanely scary it's like so creepy all right hold on okay so i'm gonna show you the sketch of this guy <laughs> uh i wouldn't even call that a bowl cut no that's like a very generous term for whatever Yikes. the hell this is yeah okay yeah like it's i don't i i i don't know <laughs> i don't know i don't know show me that that Video again of uh, his friend, like the kid. Oh my God, don't bring Dakota into this. He had very long, luxurious show me, show, hair. Well, that was all right, all right, a different all right. time, but just okay. show me Dakota. No, I don't like your face. Sorry, honey. The sketch looks a lot like Dakota. The eyes? Yeah. Yeah, okay, but... No, not just the eyes. It's the eyes. It's the nose. Whenever this interview was taking place was years later. Yeah, a few years later. So his hair has changed, but I mean, it's a, it's only gotten longer. Doesn't necessarily mean it changed. Yeah, I don't know, hon. I could be wrong. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, let's not start accusing. I'm not accusing private, private I'm not accusing, citizens. I'm not accusing of anybody of anything, but I'm saying that sketch looks like Dakota. Given the facts of the case, I mean, you have a witness saying that they saw Logan with a couple of white guys, and that sketch is close to Dakota. I would look into Dakota. Okay, but he hadn't been talking to any of his friends. That doesn't, I mean, he, sure, he hadn't been, but who knows if he did that night? Yeah. Do we Do we know, did they pull cell phone records? They did. They ended up, yeah, they did. And so they didn't They're find, not going to release anything, of course. No, yeah, but, of course not. You know, the only I thing mean, that they did release were like GPS records, basically, okay. 
Um, well, well, that's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. So no identification came from this sketch. We have to say in all caps. <laughs> I'm not saying it is Dakota. I'm just saying it looks a lot like him. Oh, my God. All right. Well, so the woman, this witness, she didn't get a good look at the second guy. And so they didn't release a sketch of him. And that was in 2017. And to this day, no trace of Logan has been found still. I'm sorry. What was the timeline on the witness? So So this is May 20th. Yeah, so she she saw she said that this was that day, but again, she didn't come forward till a year later. Okay, so so all of this is you know all right. So we don't have an exact time. No, 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 no. Daytime. Yeah, presumably. Yeah. So sometime during the day, mm-hmm. uh, the day after, the day after he was last seen, not not when he goes missing. Right. Right. But again, it's a year later, so... Yeah, so who knows? I mean, it's just, that's that's tough. Like, it's great that she came forward, you know, because that's what we hope for in all of these cases, right? Absolutely, like, that's the yes. whole point of, of, of publicizing keep, them yes, and yes, keeping, keeping them out, right? Yes, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you, it's hard to say how yeah, you accurate have, you have any to take, of this is. You have is. to take the, that witness's account with a grain of salt because mm-hmm. a year has gone by, this was somebody driving past a stopped vehicle on a, on a highway. Right. Uh, you know, I, I've driven Route 5. Oh. It, it takes you into Seattle. Mm. Um, so I haven't driven that stretch of mm-hmm. Route 5, but it's a highway. Yeah. So. Presumably you're going fast. Cars are driving fast. Yeah. yeah. So you might not see everything that you think you see. Right. Some members of Logan's family do believe that the identity crisis he was going through led to him simply walking away and starting a new life. But, you know, I hate this idea for basically the same reasons that I always hate this idea. Like no wallet, no money, no car, no phone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We go over this in every case where that's a possibility. I know, I hate it. It's it's absurd to to just think that somebody's just going to leave all of that stuff behind. Yeah. Plus, he also had a severe peanut allergy, and he didn't even have his EpiPen with him. Like, just stuff like that, you where, know? Where was his EpiPen? I think was it was just at home. Was that also in the car? No, I think it was at home. Okay. But also, he had trouble, like, successfully finishing his freshman year of college. So I have a hard time buying that he has been able to disappear willingly without a trace and just stay gone for so long. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I mean, I would also... I would also say, you said he was born in 96, mm-hmm. so I'm going to sound like an old man <laughs> here, <laughs> but like that generation, oh God! I mean, they don't stay off social media. I mean, I guess. I mean, I don't you know. don't stay off social media. All right. I'm just saying, like, it, it just, it's not like, it's not like the cases before where you have somebody that's like in their 40s or Mm -hmm. 50s or however old Hoagie was who Mm -hmm. supposedly walked off or whatever. Like, you know, who knows if he even had a MySpace account, let alone a Facebook account. But like you said, friends and family were monitoring his social media Mm -hmm. accounts and nothing happened. Right. I just don't see that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I just, I, I, I just don't think it's as easy to completely disappear as right. some people think it is, especially when you've lived, you know, not that he lived like a completely sheltered life, but I mean, to an extent he did. Like he grew up like in a small town with a family and, you, you know, yeah. like it's just, he wasn't living on the streets. He wasn't this streetwise kind of kid who was just used to, getting paid under the table. I, I don't know. It was just, I, I, I don't know that I necessarily buy it. No, I don't buy it at all. Yeah. And so another theory, of course, is the whole drug thing. People, some people think that he either ran afoul of some drug dealers <laughs> that he owed money to, or he overdosed on something. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't weed. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also just no evidence that Logan did any harder drugs. Right. Or that he was involved in anything that truly would have been dangerous. And yes, right. like any time you're buying drugs, whatever the drug is, and you're involving yourself in that world, like, yes, your risk factors do go up. 
Yeah, but I, I mean, pot dealers. Uh, right. No, Come it, on. I know. I know. So, uh, yes, I mean, his risk is greater than zero, but sure. like, but I wouldn't call it high either. Yeah. Yeah. This guy isn't screwing over the Colombian cartel. Right. Right. One more reasonable theory is that mental illness came into play. As I mentioned, Logan had been acting a little bit paranoid recently, and his behavior on that last day that he was seen was out of character for him. Whether it was because of the of the drugs like Ginny things, or because you know, nineteen this this age, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, like that is the age where a lot of mental illnesses, especially in young men, Mm -hmm. that have not presented themselves up to this point, do start to present themselves. And so that really could have been a factor. And and we don't know if it is, but I mean, to me, out of the theories, this is the most viable, right? Like this is a very reasonable one for me. And I should also, and this again, because I mentioned before that there was GPS data, police were able to get Logan's cell phone records and it showed his movements from that day. And he was he, I, sh- I say he, but we don't the know cell his phone. phone. Yes, was basically just driving on the highway, like north, south, north, south, like just going back and forth, back and forth, hmm. until his car stopped, where it was eventually impounded. Interesting. Yeah. Some people theorize that he parked his car and went into the woods to take his own life. And that the dogs and the heat-seeking aircraft and everything else simply missed him. Because from what I understand, they were dense woods. Well, it's Washington State. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's basically a rainforest. Right. And and we, we and I've never been to Washington State. So, you know, I, I knew that intellectually, but I didn't really have a, uh, much of a concept of that. And I still don't because I've still never seen it in person. But when we did the Kyron Horman case, Mm -hmm. because he also went missing from this area and I looked at the aerial aerial photos of the land next to his school and it it just boggled my mind. I mean, yeah, you know, because I think of the schools around here. And like, maybe you get like four trees (laughs) and that's it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah. This is, this is also a former swampland. So it's it's a a little different. It's totally different. And so, yeah, like, and especially even here, like when I think of trees on the side of a highway, we're not talking a difficult terrain to deal with here. Right. You know what I mean? And so like, that's, the vision that I had in my head when I'm reading about this, like, Oh, trees on the side of a highway, like you can take care of that in 10 minutes. But again, Washington state is just a whole different ball game. And so a lot of people think it would be incredibly easy to miss somebody. Sure. The, the only issue that I have with that is that, that, you know, if we're going off of the theory that he was in his car, Mm -hmm. that gives you a, a, a limited entry point into the woods. Right. So it gives you a limited search area. Mm-hmm. You know, there's only Because so I would imagine he's not going to walk 10 miles. Before cutting into the woods? No. It's yeah. Prob- the entry point is going to be probably somewhere around his car. Right. Which gives you a search radius. And they did. They searched in a two-mile yeah. radius. Yeah. And maybe they probably could have, should have expanded that, but I don't yeah. know the circumstances behind the, the, the search and maybe maybe they did and they just didn't release how, mm-hmm. how much they searched. Like you said, it's not it's not like this person is going to go, it's not like Logan's going to walk 10 miles and then decide to cut into the woods to take his own mm-hmm. life. If, if we're talking about ment- mental illness and something happening at the car to trigger something, he's probably going to storm off right there, go into the woods right there Mm -hmm. and maybe not take his life right away at the edge of the woods. Maybe he continues to walk, but I, I, I don't know. I I feel like they would have found him. Yeah. I, it's so hard to say it really is. Others of course believe that it was foul play. Logan's uncle is a retired police officer and he believes that, the sheriff's department cleared the boyfriend too quickly. 
Yeah, I I just don't know enough about the circumstances of his background to, yeah. to pass judgment on it. Yeah, neither do I. But the uncle doesn't seem to place much weight on polygraphs. And, you know, he thinks that... I agree with that as right, well. Right, exactly. So he thinks that the boyfriend could still be involved. Yeah, great that he was willing to take a polygraph. I, right. I said it, you know, initially, I, I wouldn't have cleared him right away. But, right, right. You know, it's... It, lowers him on the suspect pool for mm -hmm. for me but it doesn't eliminate him other people who could be involved of course are the men that witnesses saw around logan's car but law enforcement has no idea if they were involved or if they know anything about logan's disappearance or even who they are right though it is telling that nobody has come forward in the five years since his disappearance and said, Oh yeah, like I was there, I was with Logan, but then he left or, you know, whatever, whatever. Nobody has come forward ever admitting that they saw Logan on May 20th. Ginny and the rest of Logan's family haven't given up hope that they'll find answers in his case. They hired a private investigator to look into his disappearance they paint rocks with Logan's information and a link to their Facebook group and they leave them on the hiking trails so that anyone who may see something on a hike can report it. The reward has increased to $15,000 and they still put up posters all around town. Many people in Tumwater and around the area still sport Find 29 stickers on the back windows of their cars with an illustration of Logan in his football uniform. Logan's family is still actively looking for witnesses or anyone with information about his disappearance. There's a post on the Bring Back Logan Instagram account that spoke about rumors that people know more than they're letting on. It says in part, quote, If this is true, I would implore you to reconsider your choice to remain silent. You cannot imagine the daily stress, emotional pain, and depression Logan's family and friends are experiencing. We would not wish this on anyone. End quote. Logan Drew Schindelman has been missing from Rochester, Washington since May 19th, 2016. He was six feet tall and between 150 and 190 pounds. He was of mixed race, black, white, and Saudi Arabian. He had black hair, brown eyes, and a small scar on his left forearm. He was 19 years old when he went missing. He would be 24 today. If you have any information about what happened to Logan Schindelman, please contact the Thurston County Sheriff's Office at 360-786-5500. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And then they were gone is a little monster production. Hey, you guys.